My name is Magali De Castro. I'm the clinical director here at HotDoc, and I'm also a credential nurse immunizer and a primary care nurse consultant. Now, this webinar is brought to you by HotDoc. Uh, HotDoc prides itself in offering clinics um, easier ways of managing day-to-day -day things, things like com communicating with patients more easily, uh, and we believe that obviously adding value and and um, providing good quality practical education um, and training is um, pivotal in order to support our practices. So what we'll be covering today in this Introduction to Immunizations and Cold, change man uh, cold Chain Management, uh, the role of immunizations in general practice. We'll also look at cold chain management, which is also like a fancy way of saying how we keep vaccines at a safe temperature. We will also discuss informed patient consent and look at what is involved in a pre-vaccination screening. And we'll also discuss best ways to improve immunization uptake in your practice. Now, keep in mind, this is an introduction course. We only really have about 40 to 45 minutes for this webinar. So we will be, um, it's a very sort of introductory level. If you need additional information, I will be talking about what resources you can access to get more information. And I'll also be giving you um, the email address that you can send um, additional questions to. So let's talk a little bit about the role of immunization in general practice. Why do we immunize? Well, one of the key things is immunization is one of the most effective public health interventions, second only to clean um, drinking water and in terms of the, the health impact across the world. Worldwide, we know the program prevents 2.5 million deaths each and every year. And Australia in particular has um, one of the most comprehensive funded immunization programs in the world. Because of this, we see that a lot of the vaccine preventable diseases are extremely rare and sometimes hardly ever seen in Australia. In order to keep it that way, obviously we need to make sure that our immunization uptake rates and coverage rates are um, at a good level. Okay, so let's have a look at um, the role of general practice specifically in uh, immunization. General practice is ideally positioned to provide prevention and health promotion care to the community. Why is that? Obviously, because we're seeing patients on a day-to-day -day basis, they trust us, they come to us for all sorts of other things. So we have to make sure that, and this is, this is key, this is probably the one takeaway that I want you to leave this session with, is every single encounter that we have with the patient is an opportunity to check their immunization status. Every encounter, so there's no excuses really. Um, in terms of catch of vaccinations, we're not just talking about children, we're also looking at adults. Adults, uh, adult vaccinations are one of the biggest gaps that we have. We know that usually children coverage rates tend to be around the 90s uh, or 90, ideally we, we want to aim for around above 95%. In Australia, we do fairly well with that. But the adult immunization coverage rate for, you know, a range of things, things like pneumococcal or um, uh, influenza, tends to be a lot lower, around 50-60% coverage. Obviously, the reason why we're concerned about overall coverage is because we have what's called herd immunity. So herd immunity is obviously when the more people we protect, the fewer people can contract diseases, and then the more we're able to protect those people who are either not able to be immunized because um, of whatever contraindication they may have, um, or because the you know a certain vaccine might not be registered for that um, age group, or um, because their body would just, if sometimes you have um, immunosuppressed uh, patients whose bodies just wouldn't respond to immunizations and wouldn't actually generate the protection. So, in a way, we want to obviously keep our immunization rates high so that we can protect those who are most vulnerable as well as ourselves, of course. Now, when I talk about the National Immunization Program, or the NIP, we're referring to all the vaccines that are um, funded as part of the government program. So if you actually look this up or Google this, you should have posters like this in your practices, where you actually have what we call the schedule, and it outlines what immunizations are going to be covered or are provided by the government free of charge for people who are eligible, either because of those um, they're in the right age group for those vaccines, or because of specific risk factors. So as you can see, obviously we have all the childhood immunizations, and then there's the school programs, and then there's immunizations for special at-risk groups. The other thing to note is sometimes you also have variations in terms of um, what's available in different states. So different states might have additional 
funded vaccine, so it's important that you um, keep up to date and download it as well as the National Immunization Program schedule, the, the schedule for your state, because there might be additional funded vaccines available in your area. Now, let's get into a bit of cold chain management. I've, I've taught this, this topic a lot, and it's one of those things that a lot of clinics you know, struggle with. It's, it's essential in terms of uh, type of training that everybody in the practice should have access to. So every person from reception staff to all the clinical staff should really be trained on cold chain management. So what do we mean when we talk about cold chain? So cold chain is really referring to how we keep the vaccines from the uh, the the moment that they're manufactured up until the moment of administration. So all of the transportation and the storage um, at a good safe temperature. The temperature range for um, safety of vaccines is between plus two degrees Celsius to plus eight degrees Celsius. So we have a uh, our national guidelines for cold chain management is called Strive for Five. The reason it's called tri Strive for Five because obviously five being between two and eight. If you try and aim for your vaccine fridges to be sitting around the five degree mark, it means that you've got a little bit of, of safety uh, above and below it. So how sensitive are vaccines? Why do we make such a big deal about you know keeping them in that in that uh, temperature range? The reason we do that is because vaccines are actually quite delicate and they're less effective or completely ineffective if they're destroyed by changes like them freezing. And by freezing, we mean just hitting zero degrees or below. It doesn't necessarily have to look frozen. You don't have to have little shards of ice swimming in it for it to be um, actually frozen and destroyed. Or if they're allowed to get too hot, so if we have had power outages or someone left the, the vaccine fridge door open and the vaccines get too hot, again, it will either destroy them or it might decrease the, the potency, the time that they're going to be potent um, and viable. The other, the other issue that can affect vaccines is if they're exposed to direct sunlight or fluorescent light, which we often have in, in uh, clinics or even within the fridges themselves. So let's talk a little bit about the equipment and the people involved in cold chain management. So some of the key things are the refrigerator that we use, which hopefully I'm, I'm hoping the majority of the clinics that are going through this webinar have purpose-built vaccine fridges. So the, the refrigerator that you use has to have enough capacity to store your maximum need. Usually the maximum need is going to be around now, flu season, when we've got that additional uh, stock uh, in place. And obviously we want to make sure that there's enough space in the fridge to accommodate all of that. We need to have a fridge that's reliable and maintained regularly. We need to learn about our refrigerator, know your refrigerator. And what I mean by that is understanding the hot spots and the cold spots that can be in your fridge. Some fridges might be colder at the top, some fridges might be colder at the bottom. All fridges will be quite cold on all the walls, so you want to make sure that you stay away from them. Um, so we ensure also that, that if you're using a um, any kind of thermometer, so purpose-built vaccine fridges will usually come with their own thermometer and you'll be able to usually read it on the uh, on the door. Make sure that it's set to Celsius, degrees Celsius, not Fahrenheit, because again, that'll be a, that'll create a lot of problems if we're trying to get the fridge into the right temperature set and we're not measuring it correctly. If you're using an a, it's external thermometer, check that the, they're accurate and that the batteries have been replaced on a regular basis. So there are checks that we can do to check the accuracy of a thermometer. There's the slurry test, and there's more about that um, in the, um, there's more information about that in the Strive for Five guidelines. Make sure that you're using a, um, a temperature monitor charge for each refrigerator. Um, make sure that you keep the door openings to a minimum. So obviously train your staff so that if you're, um, if you need to get a vaccine out and you have a fridge that has a solid door, try and have a map of where the vaccines are kept so that it's very quick and easy. Open the door, get your vaccine, and away you go. Do not store food or other goods in your vaccine refrigerator. I have seen this many a time going into clinics and find that it, it may not be food. Sometimes it is you know, people's lunches in the corner. But um, you'll, you'll find that they'll still store other things, other, uh, either other medications or uh, yeah, other things that they just want to keep cold. Not a good idea, because every item that we add 
will uh, affect the temperature balance. The other thing is all people handling vaccines need to receive training. So there's no reason why reception staff and all your admin staff shouldn't be trained, even the GPs shouldn't be trained on what are we looking for in terms of keeping our vaccines safe. Um, make sure that you have a trained designated person responsible for vaccine storage and then a backup person. So who's going to be the person that if something goes wrong, staff know to contact to go, hey, how do we get help on this? How do we fix this? Some storage tips. Do not crowd the vaccines or overfill the shelves. The more crowded a vaccine fridge is, the less the air is going to be able to circulate and the more, um, uh, more of a challenge is going to be for that fridge to be able to keep a stable temperature. Make sure that you have at least a four centimeter gap from all fridge walls. Yeah, we do not want the vaccines touching the fridge walls. Make sure that you keep the vaccines in their original boxes. And this is for a couple of reasons. So it's not just, well, as we said before, they're light sensitive, so we want to protect them. But also it's an additional barrier protecting from extreme cold. Yeah, so it'd be protecting them from getting too cold or even to the point of um, zero degrees. Make sure that you undertake a self audit of the fridge at least every 12 months. As part of the Strive for Five guidelines, which I will add a link to as part of the course, but I'll show you a, an image of what it looks like and you can Google that right now. Um, as part of the Strike 5 guidelines, there is actually an audit checklist included as one of the appendix. So you can go through that, do that once every 12 months and it'll make sure that you're obviously keeping everything up to date. Make, make sure that you keep vaccine stock to a minimum. So only usually around a month's supply. The reason for this is should a breach happen or should we have an issue with um, obviously the, uh, the cold chain, uh, it means that then if we if we need to destroy any of these vaccines, then we haven't, uh, the, the loss is not as great. So if we're keeping it to a month supply, then again, it's a way of minimizing uh, the, the, the financial loss. And it's a great, it's actually quite a considerable uh, financial loss that happens every year due to yeah, vaccine mismanagement. And also make sure that you avoid placing your refrigerator against any outside walls or against direct sunlight. Because obviously, again, it means that the fridge is gonna have to work harder to keep that stable temperature. Now, data loggers, so I would, I would suspect or ideally hope that the majority of the clinics have access to a data logger. A lot of the purpose-built vaccine fridges will throw it in as an additional um, kind of bonus when you, when you buy them nowadays. But if you do not have it, and this is a separate external device that you can usually plug into a computer and it'll give you a reading over time of the temperatures of your fridge. If you do, do not have one, call your medical supplier and buy one. That is, it's a great thing to have as a, a backup reading of your uh, vaccine temperatures. So this is in addition to the temperature that's displayed on the, the vaccine fridge door. Yeah? This is an additional little device. So the way we use these, we use this to obviously audit the fridge, make sure that the temperature that we're reading on the, on the door is accurate, or it's a second way of checking. It's another, it allows us to obviously check for hot and cold spots throughout the fridge. We can print out that report over time. So usually you set it to do a reading every five minutes. So you'll actually be able to see over time how your fridge is doing and if it's doing weird things over the weekend or when the practice is closed. Um, we also are able to double check how high or low temperatures were. So the majority of the thermometers will have a high and low max min um, reading. But this, this way with the data logger, not only are we able to check that, yeah, that in fact was as high or as low as it got, but we actually can also check how long the temperature was out of range. So for example, um, if, um, if, vaccine, if, if we're doing our maximum and minimum thermometer readings, and we see that the minimum temperature was one degree, uh, or even zero degrees, then usually that's um, it's quite a bad sign and that a lot of times if, if the vaccine, if the fridge hits zero degrees or less, the advice is nine times out of 10 for a lot of the vaccines going to be that we need to destroy them and get new stock in. But if it goes a bit hotter, so if it goes out outside the eight degrees, like they're allowed to go up to 10, 12 degrees, sometimes for up to, you know, 15 minutes, because inevitably what happens is obviously if we're doing re, uh, restocking of the fridge or if we're you know, shifting stock around, uh, vaccines are going to be getting a little bit hotter and there's a little bit more tolerance 
going to that hotter side. Obviously, we don't want them sitting at 20 degrees or even at you know 10 degrees for you know an hour plus. Um, but there is a little. It, it it is really good to be able to see how long they were out of range for. And with a max min thermometer, we don't get that. We just know how high it got or how low it got. Okay. So it's data loggers. What do we do in case of a cold chain breach? Well, in the event of a breach, the first step is obviously we isolate the vaccines. We do not discard them. The first thing that we do is we put a sign on the vaccine fridge door, say, please do not use these vaccines. They, um, the, we have had a cold chain breach. Do not throw them out. Keep them refrigerated. Keep them between plus two and plus eight. Plus eight. Contact the Department of Health for advice and make sure that obviously take any steps to, to prevent the uh, whatever caused this issue from occurring again. So someone might have unplugged the fridge or, or by mistake, or someone might have left the fridge open and not shut it the whole way or you know, whatever it is. Um, for private vaccines, you can contact the manufacturer because uh, for, for advice, because usually when you call the Department of Health, you're only gonna be able to get advice on the vaccines that were supplied um, with the government supply. And you will likely have to fill out a cold change breach form, uh, which is how you'll be able to obviously report to, to, to the government or the department what vaccines you had, uh, what the issue was, and then they'll be able to obviously advise what to do with those if it's a matter of, yeah, you'll have to destroy them, and then they'll send new stock. Or sometimes what will happen, usually when they get a bit hotter, not obviously when they touch zero, but when they get a bit hotter, they might ask you to use within the month. So bring forward their expiry date and use them within the next couple of weeks. Now, some of the common cold chain problems, obviously we have power failures that can happen and they can be inevitable. If, uh, if it's looking like it's gonna be four hours or less, then just keep them in the fridge and keep the fridge door closed. If it's something that you know is potentially going to happen or there's been a you know major power outage in your street or you've been told beforehand and it's going to be over four hours then make sure that you store the vaccines in a cooler with conditioned ice packs and I'll talk about this in a second and then once you've got them in the in the in the cooler continue to monitor the temperature by placing a thermometer so that's why you need to have a um, standalone thermometer um, in that back in a vaccine box in the cooler the reason we put it in a vaccine box is because again we're trying to recreate the conditions of the vaccines in that cooler um, so you would ideally have a data logger obviously your fridge temperature that it's reading on the door and a separate thermometer so you can actually uh, move it around and that's another way of checking different temperatures on different shelves how do we condition an ice pack? So usually we need to have frozen them or have them in the freezer for at least 12 hours so they get thoroughly frozen. And then to condition them, we remove them from the freezer, lay them out in a single road on their side, leave about five centimeters of space around each pack so that they're not touching um, too close together. And then you wait until the packs begin to sweat until you start seeing those beads of water on, on the outside of the pack, which is usually around an hour on an average day. Um, obviously, if we're having an extremely hot day, then it might take a bit less for that to happen. And the quick way of knowing is you'll start to hear the, the water sloshing about slightly inside the pack. That's how you know when they're ready to go. So that's the perfect point. So ideally, obviously, if we keep packs in the freezer, um, and then as soon as we know that we're having the likelihood of a, of a power outage, keep vaccines in the fridge, bring out your, your cold packs, your ice packs, and start conditioning them. I'll also add a link to, to download a temperature record chart. So you should have, as I said before, a chart for every vaccine fridge. And you should be recording twice a day. So at the start of the day and at the end of the day. So the things that we'd be recording is what's the maximum temperature, minimum temperature, and current temperature. And those are going to be the things that usually um, you'll have on the thermometer. You'll have max, mean, and the current temperature. Make sure that you reset it as soon as you've done that reading. So the next time that we read it, it's going to tell us since the last time we reset it, this was the highest temperature, the lowest temperature, and this is the current temperature. And remember, whenever possible, strive for five because that's going to um, give us the most range of, um, of movement, a little bit up or a little bit down, and allow for fluctuations in either the, the temperature in the room or yeah, changes in the electricity current or whatever it is. Now let's look at the pre-vaccination screening. The one of the, the most important things before you 
even begin to think about any immunization session is making sure that you have the equipment to handle an allergic reaction, also known as anaphylaxis. So you have to make sure that you prepare an anaphylaxis response kit, that you have protocols for treating or managing anaphylaxis and the right equipment and drugs necessary that are at, at hand. So if we go in a little bit more detail, the things that we need to have for a response kit should be adrenaline. Um, we need to have adrenaline, ideally a couple, uh, at least three ampules, and check the expiry date. It's very easy for us to do the check, the stop check for all the uh, all the equipment, and forget to check the adrenaline in those um, anaphylaxis kits. Check that they're within expiry. Make sure that you have um, one mil syringes and 25 millimeter length um, needles, because we'll be doing IM injection if um, this were to be the case cotton wool swabs, pen and paper so you can record the, the time of administration and the doses of, of adrenaline. And make sure that you have laminated copies of the adrenaline doses, which can actually be accessed from the back of the immunization handbook. So again, there's electronic versions of this, so I'll make sure that I add those to the list of downloads. And laminate a copy of the recognition and treatment of anaphylaxis, which again is also part of the immunization handbook. So in terms of what the, the process, once we make sure that we've got uh, adrenaline and things to deal with anaphylaxis, is we check the vaccines, what vaccines are going to be indicated for this patient, and include any previously missed vaccine doses. Yeah, so making sure that we're not, you know, just because they came in for a flu shot doesn't mean that it's not an opportunity, as I said, every time, every encounter is an opportunity to check for anything else that they might be missing that we could administer today. Check that any additional vaccines, you know, if any additional vaccines should be given. Check if there are any contraindications or precautions to the vaccines that are to be given. Usually the main two contraindications are either um, an allergic reaction to the same vaccine or an allergic reaction to a component that is in this vaccine. Um, make sure that the patient is the right age for the vaccine to be given. There are some vaccines that have limits, um, top or bottom age limits. So for example, rotavirus uh, vaccine, if the child reaches a certain age and they're overdue and, and they're actually now too old, we, we're actually not able to give um, the, the vaccine. Depends on the dose and depends obviously of, of where they're at, but always check that obviously we, we are actually able to, to administer the vaccine. Um, and check that the correct time interval has passed since any previous vaccines or also any blood products um, were given. So for example, we know that with, um, with live vaccines, we need to wait at least four weeks between live vaccines. You can immunize with other things and you can immunize mul give multiple immunizations on the same day. So you can give live vaccines and other vaccines on the same day, but the spacing between live vaccines should be at least four weeks. Uh, the other thing is, obviously, if you have things like hepatitis um, A or B that have multiple doses, we want to make sure, obviously, that we're respecting the time intervals so that we can make sure that the patient actually gets a good, adequate, protective response. Now, in terms of consent, getting patient consent for immunization, the, what makes valid consent is, one, that it's given voluntarily, that it was given after sufficient, appropriate, and reliable information about the procedure, being obviously the immunization, that it included the information included any potential risks as well as the benefits, and that you included a discussion of obviously the adverse events that are possible, how common they are, and what they would have to do about them. Also, uh, co consent should be obtained before each vaccination session. Don't assume that because they came in last week and they consented that that's that they should be fine to go um, again today. Every time you have a vaccination session, you need to establish consent. And consent can also be verbal or written. So it doesn't have to be, you know, they don't have to sign things. It, it can actually just be verbal consent, but make sure that you always document that in your progress notes or in your patient file. So in terms of how we communicate the risks uh, and benefits of vaccines, one of the key things, and I always talk about this, is you make sure that you use plain language. Yeah? Encour encourage patients to ask more information and provide a enough time for them to make a decision. So try and prevent rushing things if possible. Ideally, make sure that you have printed information to supplement any verbal explanations that you give, I, both before they come for immunization and also after to reinforce any messages or even if there's you know expected or potential side effects and what to do about them so that they're not alarmed should they you know have a bit have a fever or get a rash or something like that. Uh, 
you also have resources where you can get detailed vaccine information that's reliable. You don't want to just do a Google search because obviously you're going to find a truckload of, of, uh, of um, what do you call it, uh, unreliable, let's just say, uh, information online. So the good sources is obviously the Immunize Australia website and the National Centre for Immunization Research and Surveillance of Vaccine Preventable Diseases or more easily NCIRS. And obviously I'll be giving you those addresses or the links as part of the course. Now, when we're looking at best ways to improve uptake of um, immunization in our practices, uh, some of the things that we can do is obviously one, having good immunization awareness in the clinic. So what by that I mean having uh, posters in the waiting room, fact sheets and the staff are well informed. So not just about one immunization uh, program, but obviously we've got children immunizations, we have adult immunizations, we have uh, things like the, the shingles program that is going to be government funded for people in their 70s towards the end of the year. So we want to make sure that as soon as you can get your hands on uh, resources to start educating patients, that we actually start promoting that in all our channels of communication. So if you have a website, obviously start talking about it in your, on your websites. If you have a waiting room, which we all do, make sure that you've got promotional material there so that they can, so patients can access that in the meantime. Remember, as I said, check immunization status at every encounter. A lot of times I remember when I was working with the divisions in the, Medi the divisions of general practice in the Medicare locals, we would be working with providers to help them improve their immunization coverage rate and they would get a bit um, annoyed that sometimes kids would be allocated to them as due or overdue. But they said, but they're not really seeing me, I'm not their main provider, they, you know, they go to other GPs for, for um, their immunizations. Which is fair enough, but the, the point of the matter is if they, if they only get allocated to you if they have actually come to see you at some point. Yeah? We, and if we remember to this point of every encounter is an opportunity, it means that we did have opportunities to offer, catch them up, bring them up to date. And for whatever reason, those opportunities were missed. So again, if you get into a habit of every, every encounter is an opportunity, not just with children, but with adults, then um, it's, it's likely that we'll be able to lift our immunization rates, not just in the practice, but overall um, as a nation. So make sure that you have a, a robust recall and reminder system. What do I mean by this? Make sure that obviously your recall uh, and reminder processes are you know, documented, are consistent across practice staff, and that we have uh, ideally already um, in the list, because you shouldn't be adding free typing recalls as they happen. You should really have a set list that you're using on a regular basis for the more common immunizations that you do. And then obviously you're remembering to add those things as um, patients come through. Uh, also make sure you have a consistent patient notification system. Obviously at Hotdog we've got smart recalls which allows practices to um, set up their preferences and then the system will obviously integrate with the clinical software and send out the recalls as these patients become due, which then sort of takes one layer of um, away from, well, you know, the, the nurse was sick that week so no recalls went out or, you know, things like that because um, it's sort of happening on a more consistent basis. Um, but whatever system that you use, just make sure that you're staying on top of it, that you're not, you, patients aren't falling through the cracks. Also, as I said before, any patient information should really be jargon-free. So one of the things that we've done with the smart recalls is we've created templates, that, and that's the template, the information that goes out to the patient um, is not just free from jargon, but also really highlights the importance and the benefit of having that service. So for example, with an immunization, we don't just say you're due for X immunization. We say you're due for, for example, your flu immunization. Um, you, it's important to have it every year because the, the strains um, will change. So the, the strains that you're immunized against or the, the, the types of bugs that you're immunized against will change every year. Um, but also because it helps protect not just yourself, but those who are most vulnerable. So like the elderly and children. So again, sort of adding some education and context as to why it's important that they have this service. Yeah? Check your um, provider or practice due and overdue reports. You should, um, if you've got access to um, ASA online or through your uh, health professionals online or HPOS um, terminal, you would be able to check um, these reports. Usually you have to request them and 
they usually take overnight to produce and then you can log back in and access them but it'll give you obviously a lot of detail about who the patients are um, and what they're overdue for. At the moment it's mainly obviously children but um, uh, I believe towards the end of the year when we have the rollout of the shingles program it'll start including some of the adult vaccinations as well which is quite exciting. We've always wanted to have a whole of life register not just for the kiddies. Um, and finally obviously make sure that you're reporting any immunizations that you administer to the relevant register. So at the moment obviously at the moment we've got the ASA, the Australian Childhood Immunization register um, but we also have the HPV register and I believe again towards the end of the year when we have the shingles rollout it's going to be the same um, uh, yeah we'll have the register that will we'll capture the same it'll be like ASA and shingles I think we'll still have the HPV as a separate register so unfortunately there's still going to be two um, areas to send information but it's it's incredibly important to make sure that we keep these up to date because obviously if patients move around or even for ourselves if they're on you know if they don't have good records from previous encounters with health professionals then uh, you know a quick quick check with the register could bring us up to date and give tell us exactly what it is that they're due for the last couple of things that i want to highlight and again i touch on these as part of the the flu vaccination um, course but the reason why I touch on it again is because it, we get so many questions around this what's what happens with what's the role of the nurses um, depending on you know what their their scope is so with the nurses and immunization you've got RNs um, registered nurses division ones or medication and nurse division two nurses and role nurses or ENs that would have to be treating immunizations as scheduled for drugs which is what they are so it's a prescription drug which means just like with any other prescri prescription drugs it, it needs to be initiated or authorized by a GP before administration yeah so no different a GP must be available as well um, in the building at the time of administering the vaccine they don't have to be in the room but they have to be in the building and the reason for this is obviously in case of anaphylaxis they need to be there to be able to manage it um, the time that they're there must include also if the patients are, are which they should having the, their immunization then waiting 15 minutes after just in case there's there's any um, reactions the gp must still be in the building while the patient is waiting there's no point if you know it's the last patient of the day that the immunization happens the gp leaves the patients they're waiting if something happens we're stuck yeah so we have to make sure that there's a gp in the building um, in that scenario and the whoever the GP is who's authorizing or ordering that immunization must make an entry in the patient file this doesn't have to be extensive but it there has to be some kind of entry in that file when we look at the other case which is credential nurse immunizers so these are the nurses who have done a credentialing course so either a course um, through one of the, the universities or um, for example, there's the Australian College of Nurses uh, course that, that's um, online. So once you've done that course, you and obviously pass that, you may actually initiate vaccines as per the national immunization schedule. So anything that was on that NIP and the, the schedule and the program, the national immunization program, these nurses can initiate um, and there is no need for the GP to intervene at any point so they can actually just handle everything by themselves because as part of that program there's an element of dealing with anaphylaxis and obviously including or upskilling in anaphylaxis management making sure obviously that if a nurse is working in this capacity they must have up-to-date CPR and anaphylaxis management skills so these this is sort of additional training that they need to be doing on a regular basis to make sure that obviously their um, their skills are up to date should anything happen Again, obviously, anaphylaxis is extremely rare, but it's extremely serious if it does occur. When we look at billing, which is the last thing that I wanted to kind of touch on, billing considerations, you obviously have bulk billing or private billing. When it comes to GP items, we have an item 3 or item 23. Um, so item 3 being brief, has, that's a GP item, which means it has to include a GP consultation and an entry from the GP in the patient file. Same with item 23, it's a standard console, obviously it's the most common item that we claim. Um, can be up to 20 minutes, must include a GP consult and an entry in the patient file. Then we have the nurse item 10997, which is the nurse monitoring and support item, but we can only really use this for patients who have a GP management plan in place. Uh, and 
for whom the immunization is actually mentioned as one of the things or one of the interventions that they're to have as part of their plan. Because remember, we can only really use this item if it's it's a service that is discussed it, or for a service that is discussed as part of the patient's care plan. Okay? So make sure that if you're using it for this, for this reason, that you have a documented entry about how were you supporting or monitoring the patient's chronic condition because it shouldn't just simply be the giving of the injection okay not just giving the jab but also well, did you have a discussion around you know how they're going with their medication how they're going with their you know their visits to the allied health professionals whatever else um, it is then when we're looking at private billing without medicare uh, rebate um, the scenarios where you would be doing this, obviously, sometimes if you have a nurse immunizer who, you know, you've got a clinic, you've got a busy clinic, you've got um, childhood immunizations, adult immunizations, and you're wanting them to get through, the GPs are busy doing other things, you've got a credential nurse immunizer, but we can't really claim an item number for that credential nurse immunizer, unless, obviously, we can pair it up with a uh, 10997. So in this scenario, what some clinics do is they'll just charge a private fee for that nurse consult. So it's a private, non-Medicare rebatable fee, and it can be $5, $10, $15, whatever it is. Obviously, as long as you're letting the patients know beforehand, depending on your clinic and depending on your demographic, a lot of, a lot of patients are quite happy um, with that. Also, if it means that they're going to be able to be seen quicker and not have to wait around in the, in the waiting room, $5 can be a very small price to pay to not have to sit around for an hour plus plus. So the, the other thing is that if you're, if you're using, uh, if you're giving a patient a vaccine that's not, and they're not eligible as part of the government supply, then obviously it has to be a private vaccine. They have to pay privately for that. And you must use your private stock. So for example, you could have, uh, this happens obviously a lot with travel vaccinations. So patients who are about to travel, they'll are an increased risk of coming in contact with, uh, with vaccine preventable diseases. We'll do an assessment and usually for those, the credential nurse immunizers still would need a uh, input from the GP because again, these are not vaccines that are part of the national immunization program. So those would need to be ordered by a GP. They can obviously assist with, with the discussions and everything and with the administration, but there has to be an element of a travel health consultation um, or assessment in place. Um, so with those, the other, the other scenarios, sometimes you'll have adult, uh, adult catch-ups to do. And obviously if those adult catch-ups are not falling within the, the government eligibility, then those patients will have to pay privately and will have to use private stock for those. All right. And then finally, I just wanted to show you the resources that we, that we have. There's the Australian Immunization Handbook. Uh, which you can uh, access online, and I would highly recommend that you access it online, not um, hard copy, because obviously the online copy is updated a lot more frequently, and so if you have a hard copy, chances are it's already uh, well and truly out of date in certain areas, and because you can't really know which areas, it's just safer to always go for the online version. There's also a book called Myths and Realities, um, and this is a guide for health professionals about responding to arguments against vaccination. And there is also the Strive for Five um, guidelines that I talked about, which is the National Vaccine Storage Guidelines that talks about and actually shows you uh, all the things that we've discussed in terms of the you know, thermometer placement, data loggers, um, packing a, a cooler, uh, uh, conditioning ice packs and all of that. So they're all accessible online, free of charge, and um, they all look pretty much exactly the same now. It's that uh, consistent look across the board, but they're there. So that is it for this, this session. Hopefully you've enjoyed it. Um, if you've got any questions, send them through as an email afterwards, and I'll make sure to obviously um, address and answer any questions that come through. So a question here, Magali, you talked about data loggers and taking morning and evening temperatures. Given that data loggers record the temperature at five minute intervals and that the fridge is um, purpose built and there's uh, and, and this particular fridge has alarms, is there going to be a move away from double up on recording temperatures? Uh, I know I ran into issues with the last accreditation on this one. So the key recommendation is to continue because this is the challenge when you have a, um, a data logger, usually with the data logger itself, unless you're plugging it in and downloading the information from it, 
you're not really able to check on a um, immediate basis where the fridge is at. So the rationale or the the idea behind um, doing a morning and evening temperature. So obviously, if you come in, in the first thing in the morning, you check the vaccine maximum minimum temperature. You're able to fairly quickly gauge was it out of that plus two to plus eight range? If it was, we put a pause on this before we start administering any vaccines for the day. Because otherwise, if we're waiting for the data logger and things like that, again, this is for data loggers that are not displaying um, temperatures on them, um, then it means that we could be administering during the day vaccinations that then we might have to actually call those patients back and go, oh, apologies, we actually administered a vaccine that was had been destroyed because it was outside of um, of the correct temperature range. So I don't know if there's going to be, if it's likely that we'll be moving away from doing the double um, temperature check. And look, it, I know that sometimes it can be annoying, but it's it, it can be very, it's a quick, quick process. And one of the good things to do is, that's why I said if you train reception staff, so whoever opens the clinic, for example, knows that as part of their opening um, checklist and things that they do, they check max, min, current, Write those down, reset, and that's it. Obviously, if it was outside of the range, then raise the alarm. Um, I get your point about, uh, you know, there's a, a lot of our fridges now have alarms, and even to the point where they'll contact you at home, so you'll actually get a, a page or a, or a message if the fridge back in the office has gone out of, out of range. But a lot of the clinics still are not yeah, in that capacity. And there are, obviously, to, by doing a morning and evening check, you can also see at the end of the day, you'll often see fluctuations in it getting hotter, usually because someone's opened the door and like decided to prepare everything while the door was open. So it gives us, again, ammunition to go back to the staff, clinical staff usually, and go, hey guys, you know, we need to make sure that when we're, we open the fridge, we get things out, shut the door, or make sure that we've shut the door um, properly. So yeah, still from an accreditation point of view, they want to see usually a, uh, an evidence of a data logging of a week, and they'll still want to see morning and evening um, records even if you have a, uh, a fridge that that gives you that has the alarms now I have another question um, so the question is if a GP uh, puts an immunization as given in the medical software is that automatically populated into ASA the childhood immunization register or is the or do they have to put that onto ASA as well um, also, will a copy of the presentation be emailed to participants? So I'll start with the latter. A copy of the presentation will be available online and I think yeah, as soon as it's available we'll actually send the link to access the recordings as well as download the handouts and any of the resources that I talked about. Then in terms of the, the immunizations, when you enter them into the medical software, um, it depends. So a lot of the majority of the clinical softwares do have the capacity to send the information automatically to the register. <coughs> Pardon me. Obviously only as long as you put it in the correct spot and only as long as it's been connected because sometimes that's actually a service that has to be configured. So you just have to make sure that that has been configured in your clinical software and that it's actually being sent um, accordingly. It, uh, as far as I know, it does not automatically send to the um, HPV register. So for, for the um, human papillomavirus register, you still have to do that separately. Not, it doesn't automatically do it from the from the software. And let's have a look about. Um, and another question: What are your thoughts on GPs um, scripting patients and patients bringing a vaccine in for injection? As there's concerns, obviously, of cold chain and efficacy of vaccines, is this outside the scope of nursing practice to immunize in this instance? A very good question. Uh, the Again, if you often you'll have the scenario where you don't have the vaccines, usually private vaccines, in stock at the clinic. So the GP will just write a script and get you to go down to the pharmacy, get this filled out and come back in and we'll give you the jab. If the GP has written that in the, in the patient file that they're to have whatever vaccination, and usually that's the case because that's how they print the script, so there's that trail there, and the patient goes to the pharmacy, brings back that, that, the vaccine, there's a concern of cold chain because we don't know if, you know, they drove to the pharmacy and on the way back they just left it in the car for a couple of hours when they were doing a shop or something. So, so there's an issue in that it's not ideal because it means that we can't really know what happened during transport. 
Uh, sometimes they might put it in their fridge at home because you know, I won't be able to make it to the GP, so I'll just pop it in the fridge at home and I'll bring it in tomorrow morning. Again, a lot of times the home fridge might be too hot or too cold. Um, very few households would be checking their the, their home fridges between two to eight degrees. So there are those concerns. But if say they just went downstairs, got the the vaccine, and came right back up, and we believe that obviously things are fine. A nurse, so a, 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 an RN Div 1 or a medication endorsed Div 2, would be able to use the, the, the order or essentially what the GP wrote ordering that or writing that script uh, originally as the order or authorization to administer. But you still have to make sure that the, there is a GP in the building because obviously if they immunize and there's an event, then we need to be able to have access to someone who could manage that. Okay. Um, let's have a look. Another question. Um, if you have a purpose-built vaccine fridge with built-in temp monitor and data logger, do we need to have a separate battery-operated temp temperature monitor? And do we need to document that temperature also? It's a very good question. If you have a vaccine fridge, you've got the that has the temperature reading on the door, so you're able to do your maximum and minimum temperatures. And you have a data logger, so you're able to, you know, if there's something out of range or if you just want to check what it did over the week and any fluctuations, you can do that. That's fantastic. You do not technically have to have a separate temp uh, thermometer. It is a good idea, though, because if you're needing, so say, if something happened and you wanted to move the stock into a cooler, you wouldn't have a way of tracking the temperature in that cooler if obviously your vaccine fridge is down. So having a separate thermometer, and they're not super expensive, so they're a good thing to have, um, it's it's a good idea. If you decide to have it, so in some of the clinics where I work, we do have a separate thermometer and we use it as a second, as a backup essentially, to make sure that obviously the reading that we're getting on the door of the fridge uh, is matching what this other thermometer that we're moving around inside the fridge is telling us, because some, sometimes what we've found is that the what the reading on the door is obviously just one spot in the fridge but it might be giving you the coldest spot or it might be giving you the hottest spots and then we find that some shelves are actually colder by one or two degrees even <clears throat> than that 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 reading so it is handy to have that extra one if you do have that extra one you don't need to keep a second a second um, chart for it you would just keep your max min for the fridge using whichever indicator you want okay and then there's a question about, could we also email the answers to today's questions? This, the entire Q&A section, the, the entire recording will be actually one of the videos that's included as part of the, the course. So you'll actually be able to have all of those available. And I think that is all the questions that we have. Thank you so much, everyone, for, for your time and for participating in this. I hope this has been um, helpful and beneficial. You've got the, my email there. It's md at hotdoc.com.au. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to send us a message. Thank you very much and have a lovely day.